Perfect. Thank you, Priya. So today, welcome, Prin Haundal. Good afternoon. It's fabulous to see you all here. I'm very pleased to announce that this is one of our first events looking at kind of dementia care and how we can in, improve it by using the use of technology. Um, there's been really good uptake, so I think there may be a possibly a second event after this, but we'll see how today goes. Um, apologies for those people who were really keen to share their stories and their innovation, but unfortunately we had quite a small time scale today. So please, there will be other opportunities where perhaps we can look at sharing more stories, but that's fab. I'm really pleased to be here and get this on, on the ball today. We do have um, a few presentations. They're going to be quite short so it's going to be very kind of almost like speed dating so bear with us i am going to try and stick to time so we will finish on time today um we will have a presentation and then a, a small question and answer at the end of each one so if you do have any questions please put them in the chat um and priya could I have the next slide please have we really put that room out today okay. perfect so just a few housekeeping rules uh, I imagine most of you are working from home, so you're probably in the comfort of your own home, so there should be no fires or anything like that. <laughs> but if you do, hopefully you know how to leave your own house. Um, but for the purpose of today, if you could please mute your microphones unless you're, you're presenting, it just makes it easier for everybody around. Also, if you've got any questions, like I've said, please share them in the in the chat comments. The session is recorded today, so you will be able to access it afterwards, but obviously, you know, if you don't want to be in the video recording, please don't put on your camera. Um, just be mindful of that. So I think we are just about on time for one of our first presentations. Priya, if I could have the next slide, please. Perfect. So today, as you can see, we've got six presentations. They're all really exciting. Um, and first up today, we're going to have Thomas Huntley, who's the assistant team lead in Torvine Borough Council in the community service team. So Tom's going to be talking about his use of Amazon Alexas um, and how they've been able to kind of promote independence and reduce social isolation. So this will be our first speaker. We are going to try and keep it on schedule. So I know people are still coming in, but if we don't start now, we're going to run late. So I'm going to kick off with Tom first. So Tom, it's over to you. And please use the chat function, like I said, for any questions for Tom to answer after his presentation. All right, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping you can see my screen at the moment. I'm just going to put the presentation up. Um, I can't see any any faces or any hands going up, so I'm just going to um, plow on. Um, let me know if this isn't working, Amy. Um, so. My name is Tom Hentley. I'm the assistant team lead in Torvine County Borough Council, uh, the community services team. Uh, part of my role is to uh, lead the assistive technology team. And within that, we have been using um, Amazon Alexa to sort of um, help and support people living with dementia in the community. So um, to get started, I thought we I'll just go over quickly what I'm going to be discussing. So. Uh, we'll discuss the aims of our project when we first started. Um, we'll then look at some of the equipment that we have been using um, in Torvine. We'll look at the apps and features that we have found most useful um, as, uh, within the um, Amazon Alexa package. Uh, we'll provide a quick overview of a few couple of case studies. And then uh, after that, we will just go over a couple, some of our future plans as well. So. So we've been new, uh, working with Amazon Alexa since the summer of uh, 2018. Um, initially, the equipment was trialled on a very small scale with just one service user using the equipment. Uh, this individual, um, had a, she, was, she didn't have dementia, she was just living with a long term illness and had some uh, physical disabilities with poor dexterity. And so the aim for this initial trial was just to improve her general well-being and reduce carer stress. Um, her son was her main carer and was living with her at the time. And we wanted to enable them to have more control over their environment um, so through the use of smart home equipment, including um, obviously voice activated um, lights and controlling the heating through the use of a hive system. The initial trial was very promising and so we uh, made an, an ICF bid uh, to expand this pilot. And the aims of this pilot was then to uh, support uh, people living with dementia, uh, also, but also long term illnesses and uh, learn those with learning disabilities. And we wanted to reduce social isolation and promote their independence. OK, 
So if we have a quick look at the equipment that we used, um, obviously the majority of this equipment, we started off using um, Amazon's own uh, equipment. Um, the Amazon Show, Amazon Echo Plus and the Dot were all utilised. Um, you, we, we had to use the more expensive um, Echo Plus and Amazon Show because they act as a hub for smart home equipment and this enables you to connect those smart bulbs and smart plugs uh, to the system to enable people to, to use them. We also utilised Echo Dots as well, just as peripheral devices throughout the home so we could expand um, the coverage. So if um, somebody wanted to be able to control the lights in the bedroom, we would put one of these dots in the bedroom so they could control the lights from there. Um, we also made use of smart bulbs. I'm not going to go on too much about these. You all know how they work. Um, they connect to the Alexa and then allow people to um, control them. Same for the smart plugs. Generally speaking, we would use smart plugs to control devices such as lamps, um, but we might also link them up to um, other electronic devices if we need to, say, turn the television off at a certain time. They can be utilised for that. And at the time when we first started this pilot, we we're also using something called Harmony Hubs. Uh, these are effectively a universal remote control that enables people to control their television through voice. So for this lady um, in the initial trial, um, she had poor dexterity, couldn't use her remote control, and this enabled her to um, control her television, turn it on and off and watch what she wanted. Unfortunately, Log Logitech, the company who manufactures these devices, are no longer allowing new accounts to be set up. And so we are looking to um, find alternatives to this and we're investigating the use of the uh, Amazon Fire Cube just to see if we can um, use that as a replacement to what was a very good device in the Harmony Hub. So that's the equipment that we used. Um, if we have a look now at the apps and features, so the apps, the apps and features, this is the sort of the, the most important section for us really, particularly when we're talking about supporting people with dementia, because there's one thing to have the hardware uh, there, but we need to sort of um, set it up in a way that um, enables us to get the most benefit out of it for people who are living with dementia. So, ooh. so the first thing that we've been uh, utilising is the uh, video and voice calls, including the drop-in feature. Um, this is the, probably the feature we've had the most success with. Um, it's it's become recent, uh, increasingly easy to use in recent years. Um, Amazon have added the feature to enable um, people to call landlines and mobile phones directly from the Alexa, whereas in the past um, we may have only been able to communicate from Alexa device to Alexa device. So it, 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 they are making improvements to this. The drop-in function is also really useful for people living with dementia because it enables family and friends to contact the individual without that person needing to answer the call. So they, there's no requirement on their part to um, to know how to uh, respond. So that's a really good feature for us. Um, and then the next one. Uh, we've also been utilising uh, radio, Audible and Amazon Music. I'm sure you're all aware of the common effect that listening to music can have. Uh, you can play music for free on Alexa, although it is restricted if you use the free service. Um, you can usually request a genre of music, like classical music, um, but otherwise there would be a paid service if people wanted to create their own playlist. Um, and quite often we would have a discussion with the family and the, uh, the the individual to find out what their favourite music is. We could support the family to create a playlist and then that um, can be easily accessible by the person who wants to listen to their favourite music. We also use um, calendars and reminders, so services such as Gmail and Outlook uh, can have their calendars linked to the Alexa and this enables people to plan appointments and set reminders for themselves. Uh, a basic feature we use is uh, lists and notes. This can be a really useful feature for those um, living with dementia because it obviously acts as a, a means of planning their day. You do have to be careful though. I remember I had one um, service user who had short -term, very poor short term memory um, and when I went to review his house was spotless and it turned out the wife was continually adding to his to-do list uh, to clean up and to clean the dishes. So um, just be careful of that one if you are um, setting that up for people. The final um, feature that we use on Alexa is actually probably the most important one and it's uh, called routines. Now routines enable us um, to utilise the hardware a bit better for people who are living with dementia because how it works we can have a trigger so that if we do something, so if this, then something else happens. So that, so for example, if we pressed um, on an Amazon button, 
then we could program the Alexa to play the Beatles. And this could be any any number of things we could we could uh, do to set this off. So another option would be if the time was uh, six o'clock in the evening, then we could have the hallway light come on. So you can see how the use of routines can really support somebody living with dementia um, and make better use of the smart bulbs, the smart plugs um, and the other hardware that we have. Um, so there's that. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is that um, one of these triggers, so in this I believe Tom might have accidentally triggered himself out of the meeting, so <laughs> hopefully Tom will quickly join us back. There we go. Hiya Tom, you're back with us. Hello. Hiya Tom, we can hear you now. There you go. I was Where kicked else? from the session, so sorry sorry about that. I, I, I'm sure you didn't mean to do that, but um, yeah, sorry. Um, am I still sharing my screen? You're not. We can see you, but we can hear you. There we go. Perfect. Okay. There we are. So Thank you. OK. Well, apologies, everyone. I don't know what happened there. Um, I don't know where I got up to, um, but I was just talking about routines and how you can have multiple um, activations from a single trigger. So if I press the button, we could have the Alexa say good morning to the individual, uh, remind them to have a drink through a custom message, give them a quick weather report and then read their um, calendar appointments for that day. So a really useful tool that I encourage you to uh, investigate if you are looking at. Amazon Alexas. So we're going to have a quick look at the case studies and um, we've got two case studies that I'm going to rattle through quickly because time is marching on. Um, we've got Mrs A. Um, Mrs A was a female, 93 year old uh, with uh, advanced dementia living on her own in sheltered accommodation. She spent the majority of her time watching television and she had four calls a day from um, the personal care team. So we needed reminders set up to remind her to, um, to, to eat and drink. And also we wanted to encourage socialisation, so contact with, with her family. Um, one of the issues we were having before the Alexa was, uh, was put in was that um, she was constantly calling her family to find out where the carers were and things like that. So we wanted to make this process of communicating with Mrs A a bit easier. So we installed an Alexa show um, next to the television so that the family could um, uh, contact uh, Mrs A whenever they uh, needed to. They would have, um, they would also have set calls throughout the day that they would, um, eat a person from the family would call. So having that structure really helped reduce the, the anxiety for Mrs A. Um, they were able to prompt for nutrition as well, verbally, um, verbally, and then we also had the reminders in as well. And what we found that this reduced anxiety for the individual and improved their health and well-being. And then quickly onto Mrs B. Be as quick as I can. So the service user was forgetting to take her medication on a regular basis. Um, we did try uh, installing a rosebud reminder clock, which is a bit of a, another sort of device that we utilise, uh, but we found that Mrs B didn't get on with this device and we were also told that she does like to uh, listen to uh, her old songs. So with this in mind, we installed um, an Alexa uh, Echo Plus. We set up Amazon Music so that she could play music through her playlist. And we also set medication prompts. Uh, we found feedback from the family was that the prompts were really successful for six months um, and then unfortunately Mrs B's situation deteriorated but throughout the time she, she did, uh, Mrs B did say that she was able to enjoy her music which was a big bonus for her. Okay and then I'm going to quickly go to the future plans, sorry if you're getting a bit of motion sickness there. So overall we had a great deal of success with um, Improve, improving people's well-being through the Amazon Alexa de, uh, devices. It's a versatile tool that we um, we are planning to use um, more and more as we move forward. We're looking to, um, to we're investigating the use of motion sensors to trigger routines. So if let's say if a gentleman gets out of bed, we can have the lights turn on through the use of motion sensors. We're also going to be looking at the use of Tile and Alexa to help people uh, find their lost objects. So if, for those of you who don't know, a Tile is a device that we can attach to a key, a wallet, um, a remote control, and then we could ask Alexa to find the 
um, the remote and it would then play a noise for the person to find it. And we're always looking for more ideas as well to, to try out on people. Um, Amazon are very good. They have a, a dedicated web page to um, with ideas um, for how Alexa can support people um, with different disabilities, but including memory loss as well. And that I'm hoping is the end. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening. And if there are any questions, um, feel free to ask. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. It's very insightful and, and fab to hear what you, you've got going on there in Torbine. There, there's been one question put in the chat, so if anybody else has got any questions, we do have a minute or two to answer them. But the first one was, um, what is the cost? Um, so do you want oh, to so the, what the cost is at the moment for, for Tor, well, you could say Torbine, but roughly what the cost of the equipment as well? So the cost of the equipment, the equipment that we generally use, the um, Alexa show, I believe, is currently two hundred uh, two hundred and sixty nine ninety nine. I believe um, they've also brought out a larger um, device now, a 15 and a half inch screen, uh, which is, uh, I believe, 280 pounds. But then the smaller devices, so the Echo Dots, they can be picked up for 50 pounds uh, and the um, what has replaced the Echo Show Plus, uh, sorry, the Echo Plus, I believe they're 80 pounds as well. If that helps. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Donna, I can see that you're you've got your hand up. Do you want do you want to quickly ask a question? We've got a minute or two. Yeah, it was um it was just around um how we protect because some of the um, settings on on the devices will be steering to shopping and buying. You know that's part of the business model for Amazon. And how do we? Um, there, I think there obviously are ways of uh, for adjusting those settings. But how do we protect people from the the kind of big sell from Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that is a bit of a challenge. What we the approach that we took initially was to make sure that the account that we set up didn't have a a card associated with it, so that they couldn't accidentally make those purchases. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head if there is a setting that in within there that you can block purchases, but that might be something we need to look into. Thank you, and we'll quick fire these. Uh, we'll see how quick you can answer these, Tom. Can the song playlist on Alexa be activated from a different property? Uh, not that I'm aware. No. OK. Is the tile and Alexa in use or planned for future? I think you said that was for future use, wasn't it? Uh, planned for future use. We're going to be working with Kira groups to try and uh, investigate the use of that. Fab. Um, are you supplying these as a local authority and how did you get around the governance of this as we've struggled? Uh, so they are supplied by the local authority at the moment, although much a lot of the money for our, all their equipment did come from the ICF funds. Um, governance, um, I suppose we just pass that on to the service user and just say any any uh, terms and conditions they agree to with Amazon are uh, with those people rather than Torvine. And this will, it's going to have to be the last one due to timing, but where did you access the tile if it's currently available? Um, we purchased the tile from Amazon um, and yes, we're, we're just looking to see how we can utilise them with the um, Amazon now. Amazon Alexa, sorry. Perfect. Thank you, Tom. We're going to have to leave it there. We might have some time. At, um, we do have a, a break at later, so we might be able to answer some more questions in that time. But for the purpose of today, to keep today moving and on time, so we all finish on time, I'd like to hand over now to Mike Hamilton, who's the director of my improvement network, um, who's going to talk about RITA and how that's been implemented across Wales, um, as there's been quite a significant investment on this. So. Again, thank you, Tom. And now over to Mike. Thank you very much, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, I will very quickly go into my slides and apologies if pop ups come up whilst I'm presenting. I don't know whether they show on yours as well. Um, hopefully they don't. Uh, give me two seconds. Can we see that OK, Amy? Is that showing yeah, OK? That's Fine, I can see that. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So everyone, uh, I know a great deal of you will know about RITA or, already and uh, I'll give a presentation uh, as to what RITA is and, and what it's delivering uh, to those that haven't seen it yet. But uh, I also wanted to touch upon what we're now doing in Wales and uh, what the future looks like as well, which is quite exciting. Let me just move that a second. There we go. 
So uh, for those of you who are wondering who or what Rita is, uh, there she is. So Reminiscence Interactive Therapy Activities is the name, uh, hence the uh, the uh, Rita name. That, that, that name was actually uh, given to the technology by one of our long-standing customers, Northumbria Healthcare. They wanted to give Rita a persona to make the technology more approachable uh, by service users and staff alike. Uh, whether we like it or not, uh, even in this modern age many people are still quite daunted by technology no matter how easy it is so Rita has become in many cases in services across the UK a member of the team an extension of the team something else to mention is we do have a more generic version of, of Rita called rehabilitation and interactive therapy activities and there's a few different varieties of that there's Rita LD for learning disabilities there's Rita ITU uh, there's Rita kids uh, and we have even an even more generic one, Rita PE, which is patient experience for more generic use on wards uh, in hospitals to support with um, recovery. So what is Rita? Ultimately, the version I'll show you today is, is our kind of standard Rita that uh, was developed initially to support people with memory impairments. Now, what it is, is an all in one touchscreen solution that offers digital reminiscence therapy. As, me, as well as many other uh, elements of content and therapeutic activities. It says there that it's a relatively new tool in the fields of nursing and healthcare. Now, the reality is digital, uh, sorry, reminiscence therapy, art therapy um, and music therapy have been around for many years and work incredibly well. Anyone that's been uh, providing therapeutic interventions to the more complex uh, service users will know how powerful that is. Now what we've delivered is a platform for staff to be able to deliver that on the fly very quickly without a, an impact on network connect, uh, connectivity as well. Now it's aimed at offering support for older people, people with mental health issues, learning uh, disabilities, brain, acute brain injuries, stroke rehab, uh, just uh, general elderly care as a means of supporting them, supporting staff, reducing any distress or agitation, isolation, depression, and a big talking point at the moment, in many cases, delirium, which commonly gets misdiagnosed as dementia. So we provide a lot of support around that. Now, what Rita encompasses is the use of two user-friendly interactive touchscreens. The Mummy Rita is it's nicely turned by customers, which is a 24-inch monitor. That comes on a trolley and can be wheeled around nursing homes, uh, residential homes, uh, hospital wards and so on and it tends to be used more for group activities to support with social inclusion but also gets used on a one-to-one -one basis whereas the 10-inch tablet the baby Rita that tends to be used predominantly on a one-to-one -one basis to support real genuine person-centered care and getting to know your service users well uh, or better. Something that's really important is it does not require Wi-Fi or 4G to work. We, uh, we've, we understood very early on in the journey of Rita that if you rely on internet connectivity, particularly in health and social care, you're gonna hit a stumbling block. And that is exactly what it is, Wi-Fi and internet connectivity being a problem. So 95% of the content that you'll see in Rita, and I'll show you whiz through as much as I can in this uh, presentation, um, does not require Wi-Fi or 4G to work. So you will never be hampered by uh, outages in internet connectivity. The 5% that does require Wi-Fi is uh, obvious things, third party applications such as video calling, uh, downloading e-newspapers and e-books, uh, accessing Netflix and Amazon Prime and so on and so forth, if that's something that uh, service users want to access or can access. Overall, the capability is around blending entertainment with therapy. This is very much a therapeutic intervention to support staff, no matter what service they're working with, which with whoever they are in terms of comp complex uh, care, uh, with complex care needs, it gets used as a, as a nice therapeutic intervention. Now, from a memory impairment perspective, it assists patients and care home residents uh, particularly those with memory impairments in recalling and sharing events from their past. Now that could be through listening to music, watching old films, classic TV clips, famous speeches, historical events, um, historical images, as a means of, of really using that stimulation as, uh, and resonance to stimulate conversations and, and start to engage with uh, residents, sometimes who keep themselves to the themselves very much it gets that conversation started 
And uh, the next part, I think, is probably one of the most unique features of Rita, and that is the ability to use it in a really person centered way. So the both devices allow you to set up over 400 individual profiles. Now, what that enables you to do as a, as a carer is start to build up a playlist, I suppose, of information, content. It could be music, it could be TV clips, it could be images that's resonated with the individual you're having that one to one with. Then it prompts you to put a note in there as well to explain why it resonated. What was the conversation starter? What was the stimulus? And that, that gets captured to there and saved to their profile, which is brilliant to be able to be used again by the, the staff member who's delivering that one to one. But also from a continuity of care perspective, any other member of staff, if you're given a standard operating procedure of using Rita in your service, they can very quickly pick up Rita, find the profile of the individual. If they're showing signs of agitation or distress or they want to socially exclude themselves and go to their room, you can then start to use Rita in a really person centred way. Not only that, you can actually build up a digital life story for the individual. We host uh, a number of different workshops to support life story work uh, and uh, the Rita um, uh, device allows you to do that digitally. And we also have the My Life Passport as well, which is really two sides, digital A4, P, P, um, digital A4 um, sides, which allow you to uh, put in um, tidbits about the individual. Who, who are they? Where were they born? Who are their brothers and sisters? What are their likes and dislikes? Where do they work? What are their preferences? All of this can be saved to, the, to that document and it can be downloaded and sent on to other services that they may be, be uh, being transferred to. Could be a and &E, could be another ward uh, and so on and so forth. I'm going to show a couple of videos if I have time and I'll be prompted by the guys if I run out. The first video is from Katie Pritchard. She is talking about Rita from an acute care perspective. This was a elderly care and dementia ward at Imperial College Healthcare. It's a few years ago now, but she explains what Rita is, but most importantly, what kind of impact it's had on her and her staff and patients. Hello, my name is Katie Pritchard and I'm the ward manager of Albert Ward at St Mary's Hospital. We've been working with the My Improvement Network system since November, um, which has been absolutely fantastic. And we've seen huge improvements into the delivery of care for patients. It has an array of games, there's music, videos, BBC clips, My Life Story collage, and a variety of activities to keep patients stimulated during the day so that actually they are sleeping during the night. We've seen a huge improvement in the stimulation of patients and keeping them awake during the day has really helped in their sleep awake cycle. We found that a lot of patients were getting up at night time because they've been asleep during the day and this then puts them at high risk of falls, trying to get out of bed and up mobilising in the dark. We've actually reduced our falls by 50% in the last year, which is an incredible achievement. We've managed to improve the quality of the ward and we've taken it from a white standard to a gold standard with our ward accreditation programme in the Trust, which is an absolutely fantastic achievement for the patients and the staff. It's quite powerful outcomes there uh, from Katie. So briefly, um, where are we in Wales? So there's been a 10 year journey in Wales and as you can see, it's been rather successful uh, and it's only successful through the uh, value and the outcomes that are being derived uh, through utilising the system. So it's used in every single health board across Wales at the moment in multiple hospitals and it's used in now a number of care homes in each territory as well. And we're working with more and more councils to introduce uh, the RETA technology in uh, to support with that continuity of care. I know we've got Delith on the call from Wrexham. They are our latest um, uh, council that we're working with. They've got RETA into 21 different care homes and there's more coming on board in the second phase, which we're working on right now. Uh, and uh, hot off the press, we've just been told uh, this week or last week that Welsh Ambulance have come on board to undertake a pilot to engage with Rita uh, in the transport to and from hospital, uh, whether that's blue light or just patient transport. So what we're really now trying to do is build up continuity of care. Wales is set up in a great way to deliver proper integrated care. 
the fact that we're working with all all elements of that pathway means that we can have Rita being used from uh, hospital uh, from care home or home to hospital and back again and even in the ambulance service and we're talking uh, we're working with public health wales and social care wales at the moment uh, to uh, promote networking uh, collaboration and the sharing of best practice across all service settings so I'm conscious of time. I'll whiz through this. You'll probably get a headache, so I do apologise in advance because there's a lot, to, a lot of content. But just to give you an idea of what's incorporated into Rita, so we've got communication support. We've got a digital capability for individuals who are non-verbal to show where they may be experiencing pain and show me where it hurts. We have Hear Me, which is a live translation tool uh, and allows a non-verbal uh, patients and residents to communicate, whether it's through text, if they're literate or illiterate in LD terms, uh, uh, via graphics as well. And then the obvious, we've got Zoom and Teams and Skype to support with video calling. From a person-centred care approach, we've got the digital life story and the My Life Passport and the ability to profile individuals as well. We've got a whole host of sensory and relaxation content to support with increases in nutrition and hydration rates, to support with sleep therapy, to reduce safeguarding incidents and sundown, sundowning incidents, uh, and also to um, reverse in many cases and prevent delirium, which has been evidenced time and time again. We've got creative stimulation, so painting and drawing applications. We've got a digital um, garden, so you can build or grow and plant a garden and maintain the garden. We've got a, a, the same with the aquarium, so you can build an aquarium, uh, you can add your fish to it, you can um, clean your fish out, you can feed your fish, all saved to an individual profile. From a group activities perspective, we've got quiz time. Uh, we've got karaoke, we've got bingo, we've got Bruce's higher or lower, simulation horse racing, simulation pig racing, all to help with social inclusion and getting group activities together, particularly in care homes. A digital jigsaw, which is defaulted to the reminiscence images, which I'll touch upon in just a second. But you can get family members to send in their images and do jigsaws with them using the, their own family members. Uh, images. We've got a number of different carnivalesque type games such as free kick, whack-a-mole, coconut shy, shooting range. All on face value seem like a bit of a nice to have, but um, it's all supporting uh, in, um, uh, monitoring hand-eye coordination and reflex and response times. We've got photographic reminiscence broken down into a number of different categories. Each image shows a, a banner explaining what the image is displaying. It's got a star at the top right there. You can click that, favourite it, put a note in there as to why that image resonated with the individual. The same with TV clips. So we've got sporting archives. We've got uh, um, famous speeches, famous uh, interviews such as Elvis there. TV clips such as Are You Being Served, Morecambe and Wise and Dad's Army. We've got a whole array, thousands and thousands of music tracks, um, allowing you to deliver uh, music therapy in a really consultative way. So you can search by artist and genre, but you can also search by decade. So you can search for when that individual that you're having a one-to-one -one with, uh, when they were in their late teens and early twenties, for instance. And finally, we've got movie night. Movie night offers that longevity, which is great for particularly care homes to have that uh, popcorn night and movie night. And um, there's a whole array of licensed movies in there as well. From a Welsh perspective, we've got um, loads and loads of Welsh specific content, images, um, music. We've got Welsh movies. Uh, we've got um, TV shows. And now recently we've uh, filmed a uh, Anglican Church and Wales services uh, with their support with the Church of Wales to have um, church services included as well. Some of the outcomes you can expect, don't worry, I'm not going to run through all of these, but reduction in hospital emissions are key, reduction in falls by up to 77%, uh, length of stay, detox, one-to-one -one provision, and high rates of care being reduced in, uh, in care homes with commissioners investing in, in the technology. And then this is my final video. It's only a minute long. I know that I'm overrunning, but this is Ruth. This is her talking about what an impact Rita had in all of the North Tyneside CCG care homes after they invested in what they were um, delivering uh, with Rita. And this is what she had seen Rita being used in the acute hospital and part of our quality monitoring when we go around the homes, we identified there was a lack of um, activities going on within the homes. 
So we thought it was a, an ideal opportunity. We had some funding um, that was available for investment. So we decided that we would invest in buying a, a system for each of our care homes. All of our homes have been using it really, really well. We've had great success. There's been some homes have identified reductions in falls. Some have been doing a little bit more meaningful activities with the residents. Um, families have been involved so that the activities that's been going on within the homes now are more um, personal centred and the more meaningful activity that the residents are receiving. I would recommend uh, to other CCGs and, and local authorities um, as part of their strategic vision for reducing hospital admissions, for reducing one-to-one -one and for reducing falls. Um, because I think at the strategic level we can um, we can help reduce some of these in the homes. Sorry, I'm conscious that I've overrun here and I apologise. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Mike. It was very, very insightful and nice to see that it's being used in every health board and across some of the local authorities. Uh, we are very tight on time, so I will be able to answer maybe one or two questions if, if anybody does have any. Um, good to see the Welsh content. I absolutely agree. Da, da, da. What is the evidence base it it reduces hospital admissions falls. That's one question we've had through. Are you able to answer that, Mike? Yeah, I can. I can share a, a number of case studies. Um, uh, Rita isn't a magician. Uh, it doesn't have a magic arm that comes out and stops people from falling. It's it's the um, change in environment and the change in culture in which Rita promotes uh, that leads to the uh, and behaviours that leads to the reduction in falls. It's not directly attributed to Rita. It's attributed to the uh, to the impact that Rita has on the environment in which it's deployed. And we've got a number of different customers we can direct you to for you, for them to explain uh, how and why. Thanks, Mike. And like I've said before, for the purpose of today, we, we will move on. However, if there are any further questions for Mike, please pop them in the chat. And if we get time in the break, we can answer them then. Or perhaps Mike can respond by email or, or wherever. So, Next up, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. And next up, we've got Margaret Watkins, Staff Development Officer from Denbyshire. And, and Margaret's done a lot of, um, well, used a lot of different types of technology. So it'd be really interesting now to see what Margaret's got up there. Margaret, are you with us? Yeah, um, Plans are good afternoon to you all. Um, unfortunately, I'm having some technical problems. My camera's not working. And um, I'm hoping that Priya can share my um, PowerPoint presentation that I sent to her earlier, earlier in the week. Yeah. Yeah. Is that OK? Um, anyway, um, while we're waiting for that to come up, um, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me today to give a quick tour of what our experiences here um, have been in Denbyshire uh, and the use of innovative equipment um, within elderly care and with individuals living with dementia. Um, we have actually been using quite a lot of new technology um, in care, probably for the past five to ten years. Um, we've obviously been using things like the smart speakers um, for prompting and reminding uh, individuals of their appointments. And also um, smart, smart speakers have been really sort of taken on board during the past two years in our residential home settings, just in terms of music, entertainment, playing the radio with residents. Um, we've also um, previously used the virtual reality headsets in terms of dementia uh, and reminiscence work and also the just checking um, technology, um, which practitioners have helped use to help uh, in assessing people living with dementia in their own homes. And um, this technology has helped to assess and monitor actual activity to find out um, how many uh, home care calls an individual might need. Um, for example, you know, finding out how much use they're uh, making of their kitchens, how much use they're making of the bedroom, their bathroom. So in a way, just to help with assessment. Uh, so I don't know, are you having problems with my presentation or? Hi, Margaret. I think yes, it might be. I'm having, just... But um, I, I'm... I'm up now so please do prompt me apologies for that okay that's fine so that's just the background really as um to where we've got to previously over the sort of past five to ten years um but more recently uh during um i think probably about 18 months two years ago um we were actually fortunate enough to um, receive some additional funding for new technology um, which we decided to introduce to two of our residential care settings and um, some of our extra care housing settings in Denbyshire. 
um, for uh, as part of the journey. Um, so I think I'm on slide three, Priya, does that help? I think I've got a copy of the, the PowerPoint, so I can I can share that now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you. I'm really having a bad morning this morning with the other technology. There was always going to be one hiccup, it's fine. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm on slide three at the moment. Thanks okay. for that. There we go. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, we introduced the additional technology that we received uh, in our extra care settings and residential care, and that happened in the past 18 months. Um, we actually established a project team to take this work forward, um, which included an occupational therapist, um, myself, and also an individual from our um, community equipment team who had a lot of experience with um, the introduction of the previous technology. We were also very fortunate with this piece of work to have um, the support of two student social workers. One of the student social workers was actually placed in the extra care housing um, setting and the other one was in residential care and they were really invaluable because one, um, they were really on board with this new, new technology and really keen to see it working and they were also there present day in day out with, their, with the residents and the individuals and able to identify which individual would benefit most from which technology. And also, um, in terms of taking staff on board with them with the introduction of this new technology, I think if we hadn't have had those two student social workers there present in terms of the driving the technology forward and also with helping with assessing and um, introducing the technology, I think this may not have been such a, such a, um, a positive journey. However, some of the issues we did face um, did include staff um, perhaps being a bit wary of the new equipment. Um, staff lacking confidence in using the equipment. Um, the, other, the other issue we felt was um, how we were going about measuring the outcomes and what the outputs were from individuals. You know, we, we were obviously able to see individuals calming down, individuals becoming more um, sociable, individuals um, engaging. So they were all very positive outcomes. But I think sometimes we were thinking, oh, we, we should be able to see more uh, in terms of the investment of this technology. Um, the other thing we noticed is as well the importance of the context of the Welsh language and culture, which um, Mike um, from Rita did touch on earlier. And um, the other issue has been the investment, the cost of it all, and the sustainability. Um, I think we were lucky for that period of three months to have these two student social workers on board, on site, and they were able to actually embed some of this technology. Next slide, please. So the first piece of equipment we introduced was the um, Paro seal. Um, now, the reason we decided to introduce the seal um, was we felt it was quite a sort of low threatening for, for staff and individuals, really. It's something quite friendly, very easy to use um, and very, very um, uh, you know, the, te the technology is there, it's got artificial intelligence, it, it responds to individual voices, it cuddles, it hugs, it calms. Um, but actually we felt that staff and individuals would feel it as non-threatening because we have used previously the dogs, the cats, the babies um, within our residential care setting. So I think people were familiar with that idea. What was good about the Paro seal um, and the artificial intelligence it offered was that all the sensors responded really well to individuals hugging and holding him. Um, and he could respond to affections such as I love you, uh, quite like enjoyed the, the cuddling and the stroking, made sort of sense, 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 sense and noises to respond. And very happy people are very happy to be using it staff enjoyed using it individuals enjoyed using it in group sessions and um, as individuals so um really felt that this was a good place to start with this um artificial uh, intelligence really in terms of introducing technology into our care homes next slide Yeah, as um, Mike um, mentioned quite a few of us have um, purchased the Rita uh, reminiscence and interactive therapy activities. We purchased um, 
three large readers and three tablet sized readers. Again, we use them um, during lockdown with individuals when they were um, self isolating in their rooms. We use them for group activities, um, for movie nights. And again, it was so essential that we had the staff on board, that staff were happy to be using. And you know, it wasn't just something that our, that our activity coordinators were using. Individual members of staff had to be confident and enjoy using it. And I think staff did enjoy and you know enjoyed the interaction of, of the games themselves, which was a good starting point. Actually, then rolling rolling out to our residents. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, the next slide. Sorry, this is a whistle stop tour. Um, yeah, the next piece of equipment we purchased was the motion activated projector. Um, again, this is something that's been around in our complex disability teams for quite a while. Um, it's very easy to set up, very easy to use. It's just one remote control. You can use it on the floor. Um, you can use it on a table. Um, really good for sensory stimulation, reminiscence, relaxation, lots of um, uh, pictures, sensory, um, fish, gardening, colouring, just really something that was felt that had a positive impact on the residents and again something that um, staff enjoyed spending time um, doing as well and family carers and visitors as well enjoyed the, um, the physical and the social, social interaction that this projector brought about. Next slide. So yeah, the final piece of equipment um, was the actual Pepper robot, um, which uh, we called ours Tyrion, um, and first humanoid robot and uh, designed to recognize faces and human emotions. Um, again, not a very threatening piece of kit because um, it's child size, childlike, makes lovely noises as lights light, light up, the arms move, um, able to move around the building as well. Um, we did find, um, at, at present, this is still uh, um, being developed, the Pepper robot, and how we can use this in care. Um, I think we, need, we, we misjudged how much involvement in IT we'd require to actually get the Pepper robot to, to be used. It needs a lot of programming to actually be able to, to get the full benefit of what it can offer. Um, but it just seems it's a very likeable piece of kit um, that people really do engage in. Um, you know, there's games, videos, music, um, it can dance, it engage, engages in conversation, responds to individuals. Um, one thing we realised quite soon was it doesn't have the, um, the Welsh content uh, and that again would be something that we'd have had to invest in terms of programming to um, respond to any Welsh conversation and context. Um, with all these um, new pieces of technology, the best way probably for you to see and um, experience some of these um, technologies is to actually watch some of the videos. Um, there's quite a lot of content available. I think um, the next slide or the slide after is, I know, I've got a whole list of the, the, um, the links and video and YouTube clips you can watch to see how um, people have engaged and used and the responses that have been with individuals in using um, the seal, the robot, and the um, the Rita, and also the um, projector. The next slide, then. Yeah, as I mentioned, the other more general technology that we've been using is the virtual reality headsets, the smart devices, um, the Facebook portal. And with all these, we've been offering free training to staff, to family carers, and volunteers on how to use them. And that's been so crucial. It's not just a case of buying the equipment and, and leaving it in a residential home. It really needs that investment of staff um, to actually understand and make, make the, the best use of all the equipment. We've used quite a lot of the free training from Digital Community Wales um, to embed um, this equipment. And we've also been using a lot of our volunteers. Um, we've done quite a lot of intergenerational work with local colleges and secondary schools. And I've had children or young adults coming in to um, volunteer, and they've been really essential in terms of bringing in, bringing on board some of this new, new technolo technology with staff who may be a bit apprehensive in using it. Um, Again, the other thing we found is staff have been really um, happy to be using their tablets and their smartphones. Um, and we've just been sharing the various apps that are available um, in terms of you know, games, colouring, activity, activities that staff can actually um, do with residents. <coughs> Sorry, the next slide. 
Yeah, as I mentioned, um, the obs observations really is um, really needs the investment and the buy-in of staff to get some of this technology to work. We've used intergenerational work. We've also used some of this technology as part of our recruitment campaigns. Um, I think we found that new staff have really been interested and come to our stands to actually see the new technology and are interested in working in care. <clears throat> Sorry, and as, as seeing it as something new and innovative. So now the final screen, the last screen then, <coughs> sorry about this, um, is just some, as I mentioned, um, if you wanted to watch any of the videos and see any of the evidence of how good um, the technology is and how you could use it, uh, here are some links really. Uh, if you've got any questions, um, please contact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. And I now know there's going to be lots of conversations going on for Pepper the Robots in Underspends for the end of the year. I can see it now. But does anybody have any questions? We do have a few minutes that people might be able to answer. Uh, that we can. So hang on. I'll see. I thought this might happen. Right. We'll try and get through some of these. Um, good point about VR training. Uh, there's just lots of good comments, actually. Good to see how. Uh, we're using mainstream technologies. Right, are there any questions for Margaret? If not, um, we will move on to the next part. So there's a, a cost for the seal and the pepper people are interested in. Um, and there's just a comment about the expensive seal. OK, so Margaret, I don't know if you're able to answer those in the chat. That would be fab if you've got a rough idea of the cost of the, the, the seal and the pepper. Thank you. OK, if there's no more questions, um, I have questions for you. So the next part was just really kind of a quick three questions that I wanted to kind of gauge with you. What's been really interesting today is actually seeing how much engagement there is in the chat and how kind of committed everybody is in kind of using technology and moving forward and and that was one of the key things really I was hoping today would do was get these discussions going so I'm keen to kind of understand some of these questions from you so the first one is what technology have you used to support dementia care I'll put these in the chat and if you could just have a time and just kind of respond back in the chat that would be great and I'll pick up on some of the key themes the second question is also what are the barriers to using technology what what's stopping you in your day-to-day -day practice from using technology more more widely and thirdly it is are, is there an area we'd like to see technology playing a bigger part you know where where are the gaps where where could we perhaps look at bringing technology much more onto the market so i'm going to put them in the chat feel free to answer them in there we will see if there's some key themes because there may be some work that we can do as a group or across Wales in the future. So by all means, answer these. We will also take a short 10 minute break. And if we could be back here for around about quarter past two, um, just have a comfort break and we will be back. So please, in the meantime, answer the questions, have a comfort break and I will see you back in here for around about quarter past two for our next presentation from Rebecca at Social Care Wales. Yeah, yeah you can do if you want, because I think we're pretty much back. I think everybody's near enough there. So I think if we just keep the momentum going. So this morning we've had presentations from Tom, Mike and Margaret, and we've looked at things like the Amazon Alexa, Rita and Pepper the robot, etc. We've generated lots of conversations. You've all filled out that the chat this afternoon. Like I said, there's some key themes around medication management, accessibility, um, and lots of other good conversation starters that we could probably talk for hours and hours on. Um, so to move it on swiftly and to keep on time so we end today on time and to keep the momentum going, the next presentation is by Rebecca Cicero. Did I say that right? Please say I say that right. Dini <laughs> Cicero, it's a oh, I'm so close. <laughs> OK, and, and Rebecca's joined us from uh, Social Care Wales. She's an Improvement and Development Manager. And the presentation today is going to be around the ask, ask Us About Dementia Service. So Rebecca, I shall hand over to you. 
if we keep the questions as we have done throughout in the chat um, and at the end of the presentation, Rebecca, if there's any questions there, we'll try and get through them as quickly as we can. All right, so hope you're all back from the break. Hope you've had a lovely break and hand over to Rebecca now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Amy. Can everyone see the presentation on the screen? OK. Yep, it's perfect. Yep. Brill, thank you. So thanks, Amy. Um, my name's Beck Cicero and I'm an improvement and development manager at Social Care Wales. So I wanted to share with you a pilot study um, that I have been doing in partnership with the National Allied Health Professional Board. At National Allied Health Professional Lead for Dementia in Wales, Natalie Elliott, um, and with Tech Kemry. So thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak about that today. So just to give a bit of context and um, background, uh, this project essentially came from probably a lot of other innovations uh, started in the same place and um, trying to look at how we could respond to a specific issue identified by COVID. So one of the things sort of during sort of my work nationally around supporting dementia and others have picked up was uh, around sort of the issues that lockdown are placed on people get being able to get access to timely advice um around dementia um that being family carers um as well as care workers so um this was re really the starting point for where this this pilot service and where this idea came from so we know that covid has had a huge impact on uh, people living with dementia and their families uh, with the suspension of services with um, the Alzheimer's Society report sort of um, highlighting that around 80% of people living with dementia um, had reported deterioration in their symptoms as a result um, of lockdown. And also we know that that had a significant impact as well on professionals and care staff. So with um, many sort of issues around recruitment, retention, people having access to other professionals to speak to for advice around dementia. Um, as well as um, really exacerbating some ongoing issues about equity of access to specialist advice around dementia as well. Um, we know there's variation in services across Wales. We not, know not all health areas, for example, might employ specialist speech and language with dementia experience or specialist dietitians. So this, although it was sort of sparked by COVID, I think it highlighted a number of issues for us about how do you access good advice, good specialist advice um, around dementia across Wales in, in a really sort of more equitable way. So just to describe what the service is. So the service is a video consultation appointment um, where callers can ring and ask for some specific advice around an issue that they might be facing in relation to dementia. So, for example, we've had calls through around uh, from family carers speaking about how a loved one may have stopped eating or was behaving in a different way that was caused. Uh, they felt that they were distressed or was uh, um, an unusual behaviour for, for the person that they were supporting. So what we wanted to do was offer um, a video appointment service, a one-off one -off video appointment with specialist dementia practitioners to enable you to ask for some short um, and sharp advice and ideas about how to tackle a particular issue. Um, the uh, service is open to family carers and also to care workers as well, recognising that they may not always have advice to that support as well. It isn't a, a, a long term intervention. It is about that one off um, sort of advice. You, it is open for repeat calls, but um, it isn't a referral service or a long term intervention. The idea is that we could offer some really quick crisis management style advice to help people um, think through how they would manage a particular issue. So they were really the objectives of the service that we wanted to be able to provide 
that timely um, sort of access to expert advice using the technologies that were available. Um, and also we wanted to increase awareness of some of the roles um, that were around to support people living with dementia. Um, research had shown that there wasn't a huge sort of understanding of the role of allied health professionals um, amongst people living with dementia and their families. So we saw this as an opportunity to increase awareness around that as well. And really, this one was really driven by me from the social care side, but to support that peer learning as well between health and social care um, practitioners. If a care worker is calling that they have some access to learning that they could take back into their own organisation, care, home service as well. So um, just to give you a bit of background on the service design, um, like I said, this started quite quick in response to the pandemic back in May. Uh, two years ago now, actually, it'll be, won't it? Um, and um, what we had to do was quite quickly pull together the bones of a service. So the way in which we did that was a lot of co-production with the practitioners, uh, with speaking to family carers as well to find out a little bit about what would work for them, speaking to some care workers. Um, and trying to design together something that will work for everyone. But one of the big unknowns was what technology I think we had available to support us uh, to see customers, I guess, call us through that entire service. So just to give you a bit of an outline of how we approach that, we tried to take a bit of a customer focused kind of approach, really. If someone had an issue and they wanted to access a video appointment with that advice, what are the steps that they would need to go to to get from that point into a call? So we set out a bit of a, a service model business process to really think through those different steps. And from there, we work quite closely with Tech Cymru then to say, what do we currently have available in terms of technologies uh, to um, see us through these parts of the process? So the end result, the technology, the call management system, I guess, that we'd be using was Attend Anyway. So I'm not sure if people are familiar or have used Attend anyway, but it's a video based consulting service um, where you can basically set yourself up, have organisational sort of permissions and set up um, video appointments with, with a waiting room around it. But what that meant was there were gaps really in the technologies available. So how then does someone book onto that system? What happens with all the call management or the data, the information, the call capture sort of forms around that? And what do we have available? So this is where we went a little bit. What <laughs> really with a working from zero budget essentially on this, this is where we had to get quite creative. So although we had, you know, an excellent video core management system that had you know everything that you needed around it how were people going to book on so what we ended up doing was using eventbrite so we looked at what is actually out there that's pretty low cost pretty easy to use if you were to book an appointment that would be quite user friendly and in the end that's what we settled on let's try eventbrite as a means to book people onto that system now when they book onto that system and they give us the information in that sort of booking form about what they call is in relation to. How do we get that information then to the practitioners who are managing those calls? So then we thought, what have we got this free, cheap, easily available, the secure that meets some of the data protection kinds of requirements about that. And what we ended up using was SharePoint. So we've got three different technologies that are sort of free, you know, easily available to use and connected together to see us through that process. So that was the first real thinking and I think it really helped to think through that customer journey and the usability of those technologies. Most of us don't have the luxury of being able to pull together a couple of hundred thousand to build an entire system. So we have to work with what we've got, but we have to think about how the users I think, really can use and interact with some of those technologies. So um, really we had to think about, yeah, where, rather than creating something that met our vision, something that really we could test out that people were familiar with, that these were familiar technologies for people to use. 
So um, in terms of how uh, the service works, just as a really quick um, sort of oversight, we have two practitioners on each call. So they are a mix of specialisms. We could have speech and language and dietitians together, for example. They provide a half an hour call um, slot to that caller um, for them to present that issue. And then we work on a coaching model. So as that person come in, we ask them to describe what their issue is and then talk them through the situation and what they'd like to take back themselves as an action, recognising this sits outside, it's not a referral process, it's not a long term intervention, so we need a safe way to really manage those calls. The majority of callers we've had through so far are family carers, but um, I think that's about two thirds um, and the majority of the rest then are care workers, either health uh, care workers or uh, care workers from care homes um, or domiciliary care providers and dementia support workers. We've only had a small number of calls of people living with dementia at the moment. The, serve, the technology attend anyway does allow you to have a number of callers on at the same time. So it does mean that you can have a, a family member and a person living with dementia joining the same call from different locations or family members from different locations joining the same call without the need to travel. So um, I've sort of mentioned earlier some of the, the things we were hoping to achieve with it and what we've had reported back as some of those sort of outcomes self reported through our evaluation was around the benefits being around access, increased access to that specialist support, um, around uh, uh, reduced infection risk as well because we didn't people didn't have to travel and be in the same room particular concern for some family carers as well particularly during the height of covid and they found it was easier to schedule around their caring responsibilities without having to drop travel wait um you know you, you're in a waiting virtual waiting room and you're admitted within seconds um and uh, some of the outcomes that we found for practitioners was around them being able to access some of their specialist advice and support, particularly when it wasn't available during lockdown, but also when there can be waiting lists to access and support for very quick fixes. So rather than having to go through a full referral process to physio, you could ask that one off um, sort of question around why potentially someone may be falling more frequently. Um, and it did offer sort of cross discipline learning as well. So like I said, taking some of that back into your own organisation based on the experience and learning from that call. So there's just an example there of one of the calls um, that we've had about a family carer ringing for advice. In this call, we had uh, the speech and language therapist and the physiotherapist both uh, providing advice um, on the call. So they were able to offer different but complementary advice to the caller. Again, something you might have to go through a series of referral processes to get that and really not have that chance to sit down and almost like in a mini MDT really to talk through how those different options and ideas and those different disciplines could complement each other. So they were able to give you know, advice about lighting, about uh, sort of some adequate hydration as well, and then about sort of potential um, options as well for signposting and referral back, what services might be available in that area to help them um, with a bit of an ongoing plan to manage some of those issues. So that caller in this instance left with a couple of um, ideas, plans, some signposting to information, and then agreed that her follow up was to go back to the GP for uh, to arrange um, a review around falls. So um, I think, yeah, just some of the reported benefits um, from the practitioners as part of the evaluation was around that sense checking with each other, being able to speak to other professionals and those opportunities for networking, but also increase their awareness, understanding of what is available around sort of dementia services across Wales as we operate on an all Wales basis, not on a regional basis. So you could have North Wales and South Wales practitioners coming together to learn a little bit more about each other this world um, as well. So we're just at the final stages now of the second phase of the evaluation where we've been able to recruit and bring on a few different practitioners such as music therapy as well. Um, we do want to increase sort of the, the access for care and support workers as well. Um, we've had sort of quite a lot of family carers through but not so many care and support workers 
and really how can we tidy up all the technologies we've used learn from the experience of what we use and and how that's worked for people to look at if there does need to be further investment in things like a booking system and maybe test a few more issues around accessibility say for people bsl users or others who may have such sensory impairments we haven't had much of that through the service so far um the idea uh, this will be reported back to welsh government then with costing and funding at the moment we work from zero basically money to do this um but longer term sort of costs would not necessarily be around the technology but around backfilling some of the time with the practitioners and backfilling sort of time for administration and management um uh, rather than a huge investment in the cost of those technologies because they are freely available. So just to end with there, I just want to say thank you to all those who were involved and, and the collaborators um, and the pilot sites, um, because without them, this this pilot wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have got to the point where we've basically got the bones of a service that we could look to roll out more widely across Wales. So I hope that explains um, a little bit about what we've been doing and the service and just stop sharing content awesome. now. Thank you, Rebecca. Do, does anybody have any questions? We are a bit short on time. I'll leave that now. If you do, Rebecca, are you able to answer them in the, in the chat? chat? Absolutely, yeah. I'll put my email address as well in the chat for anyone who'd like to know any more, see any of the information sheets about it, or if you'd like to be involved as a pilot site for the last month, then you're more than welcome to jump on with us. So I'll stick my email in the chat for people. Thank you very much for listening as well. Perfect. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think it's a great way of being creative with the resources that you've got, particularly under pressure through COVID. So thank you very much for sharing that. <laughs> And like I said, if there are questions, Rebecca can answer in the chat. Now, to keep it on time today and ensure we finish on time, I'm going to hand over now to Tandeep Jill, who is the Senior Business Development Manager of UK and Ireland for Paincheck. So, Tandeep, are you with us? Yeah, I can see you now. Yes, thank you. you. Perfect. I'm I will spotlight you. <clears throat> there we are. Thank you. I'll hand over to you now, Tandeep. Thank you. Can you see my screen, Amy? Yeah, I can see it. It's fine. Lovely. OK, well, look, um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Tandeep Gill. Um, I'm actually a registered pharmacist, having worked in social care over the last 10 years, and I'm now heading up uh, pain check here in the UK. Um, so I'd like to thank Digital Health Wales for giving us the opportunity to show how pain check can help, I guess, improve dementia care in Wales. Um, so PainCheck is the world's first intelligence pain assessment tool. It's been used uh, by over 65% of care homes across Australia. And my responsibility is to bring this, uh, is to bring this technology to the UK. And we're actually currently in around 4,000, um, well, 4,000 care home residents are currently using PainCheck across the UK. And that includes a number of Welsh care homes too. So I think it's really important to start off with our why. Why does PainCheck exist, I guess? So initially, PainCheck was developed to give a voice to people who cannot reliably verbalise pain. Um, and that still stays tall to our mission. But recently we updated pain check to document the voice of those who can reliably self-report pain. But more importantly, we've combined and operationalized this to create the tool that we're calling pain check universal solution for people that fluctuate between two states. And we see this with um, residents that are living with mild to moderate dementia. They tend to fluctuate between two states. So today, as I'm speaking to you, I'm quite clear and I can articulate quite clearly tomorrow unfortunately dementia may kick in and as a result I'm no longer able to reliably report pain so it's an overall pain assessment tool for everyone and everywhere our use is predominantly in care homes and we're looking to expand to other sectors um, uh, across Wales which includes hospitals hospices and and of course home care too so before I go into more about pain check, I want to kind of just talk a little bit around the challenges of managing pain for people living with dementia. So 
I guess the need to have pain managed effectively is a basic human right, yeah? Um, unfortunately, with people living with dementia, pain often goes undetected and untreated. In fact, research suggests that over 50% of people living in aged care have actually got undetected and untreated pain. And there are a number of reasons for this, and I'm going to share a few now. So I guess the ability to communicate pain is compromised. So normal verbal self-reporting is used, but sadly in people living with dementia, this ability is compromised. So various changes in dementia caused by this disease unfortunately affects the ability to communicate. The issue with subjectivity is another consideration. So everyone's pain is individual as they experience pain differently. And when you combine this with the inability to communicate pain, it becomes really challenging. Um, there's also subjectivity when you, I guess, assess pain in someone who is un unable to uh, self-report and communicate pain. And that subjectivity comes from, for example, various degrees of knowing a resident. So I guess considering the high turnover of staff within aged care, we may not know the resident well enough and therefore certain behaviours, especially those facial expressions, which is one of the main areas that are assessed, are so subjective. The other challenge in aged care is lack of pain documentation. So research suggests that one third of people have no formal documentation in terms of how pain is identified and a relatively small percentage of people who cannot communicate effectively are assessed using an evidence-based assessment. Okay, A study by Andrews et al in 2019 suggested that 20% of pain episodes were assessed using an evidence-based as pain assessment tool and indeed the American Geriatric Society and the Alzheimer's Society here in the UK recommend that the assessment needs to be completed multidimensionally which includes observations. And there are a number of tools that are being used. You may have heard of Abbey Pain Scale, uh, Pain Ad, uh, but I guess this is what I mean by evidence-based clinically validated tools. Another challenge is lack of education um, and training. Um, research suggests that there is evidence of a lack of uh, education of carers. The Alzheimer's Society here in the UK suggests that staff are actually requesting more training when it comes to managing people living with dementia, and this includes uh, managing pain too. It's also confirmed that lack of training is a significant barrier to effectively manage pain, specifically in aged care. And I noticed in some of the chats earlier when we were asking those three questions, I think training came up um, quite a bit um, in, in there as well, so it's a common theme. So one of the other challenges specific um, to managing pain uh, in, with people living in dementia is, is, I guess I probably have to ask the question, why do we make sure residents living in dementia have their pain Indeed, identified? Sorry, can I stop you a second? Your screen's disappeared for me and there's some guest um, slides show up. I'm not sure what's happened. Oh, OK. Can everybody else see Tandeep's slides or? No, no. No. I can see. No. Can't see them. For me, yes. I think. Apologies. I think you should be able to see it again. There we are. You're back with us. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. No problems at all. Thanks, Amy, for calling that out. All right. OK, can you see my screen? Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, we're back to normal. Thank you. Brilliant. So, yeah, I guess the question is, why do we make sure residents living with dementia have their pain identified in a timely fashion? Um, and I guess that's to ensure that we reduce or mitigate against um, one of the key outcomes when pain is misidentified, which I guess the severity and the rate of behaviour. So mentioned previously, a lot of people living in aged care have dementia and over 90 percent at some point express behaviours or psychological symptoms of dementia, which we all know is BPSD, uh, which is often caused by pain. Um, we also have research that suggests the higher the pain, the higher severity of these behaviours. And interestingly, research shows that um, pain um, in people living with dementia can lead to around a 3.8 fold increase in the likelihood of BPSD being experienced. So this is a really big issue because often what happens in practice is that the behavioural symptoms are identified as they're, so, as they're troublesome uh, for residents and carers, but often treated with antipsychotics, 
So the cause of these behaviours is not being treated effectively, which is pain. We have evidence that suggests that there's a lot of prescribing of antipsychotics. In the UK alone, it's been reported around 180,000 prescriptions for antipsychotics have been prescribed in aged care and about 80% of them have been inadequately prescribed. So it's a really big issue and therefore we need to manage um, pain effectively to reduce the rate and severity of behaviours, to reduce the prescribing of antipsychotics, um, to enable best practice clinical care. So that sort of leads us nicely into um, the solution. OK, so Pain Check is a secure, validated pain assessment system, which brings pain assessment back to the point of care where it can be used on existing Android or iOS devices. It replaces more traditional tools like the Abbey Pain Scale or Pain Ad. And interestingly, Dr. Jennifer Abbey, who developed the Abbey Pain Scale, is actually on our advisory board and is an advocate of this technology. So looking at the research and the background, this is guess where it becomes really fascinating. So people living with some form of dementia express pain in a more heightened manner on their face as opposed to you or I. The reason for this is they've lost what we, we call learned behaviours. So I guess if I kick my shin here as I'm presenting now, I can put on a brave stoic face and keep presenting and pretend it didn't happen. Unfortunately, with people living with dementia, they do not have the cognition to fake it. So the face becomes a really good insight into that. So we use a camera on the phone to perform artificial intelligence to make identifying these movements easier and improve accuracy in probably the most subjective part of the assessment process and therefore supporting clinicians to make better interventions. So we're, we're looking at providing artificial intelligence and what we call intelligent automation to get a really good overall pain assessment. So what we've done here is we've actually started with the face um, and then as part of the pain assessment is we go on to other domains and you can see them on the left hand side there such as the behaviour analysis, the voice assessment, activity analysis, movement and body, etc. So what we've done here is we've actually automated this process to make it a binary checklist, taking away some of that clinical subjectivity that you see with the other assessments and for a person to observe a resident at the point of care to see if um, an indicative pain cue is present or not present that will give you an overall pain score and pain severity. So there are 42 different checkpoints taking around two minutes in pain check and a resident will be calibrated into a category of no pain, mild, moderate to severe. And obviously that severity would lead to some form of intervention. So it could mean the difference between therapy um, or, um, or, or paracetamol or a, or a mild opioid. Um, we, we pain trending reports also to monitor how effective interventions are in regard to assessing and reassessing pain um, as well. That might be, as I mentioned earlier, pharmaceutical or it may be therapy or a combination of both, but really assessing to see how effective interventions are to ensure pain is heading down in the right direction. Now, I've, I've also met um, seen in the in the chat earlier on about Wi-Fi. I think that's been a really common theme. Um, in there today. So actually Wi-Fi is not required to use the application at the point of care. Where Wi-Fi is needed is to actually back the data up onto the cloud to generate the reports, uh, but also integrate with EMAR and integrate with care planning solutions. We're agnostic when it comes to that, so we're integrating with several key providers uh, across the UK. Um, so I guess what I've just explained really um, is this really the tip of the iceberg. Um, what you see on the surface is the use of AI, um, which uh, improves um, accuracy, um, but along, along with the smart automation at the point of care instantaneously. Yeah. Um, but what, we see, what we've seen through our implementation of PainCheck and what our customers, predominantly care homes are sharing with us, is, is, is some clinical and administrative benefits. I just want to go through some of these because um, they're, they're really interesting. So we're actually starting to see much quicker and more accurate diagnosis of pain for all residents. 
Um, some of our providers are actually um, sharing the data quite quickly with GPs. So therefore, medication and, and treatment can get to the resident quicker. Yeah. In, in, interestingly, um, GPs can have access to a care home's uh, pain assessments as well. So again, that's quite instantaneous in terms of communication. Um, the higher the pain, the greater the distress, and therefore we're starting to see now more reduced behaviours. And, and in that way, we've actually seen a reduction in the use of antipsychotics and benzodiazepines. So a 12-month case study that we did with Orchard Care, that got around 23 care homes, they've seen a 46% reduction in benzodiazepine usage and a 25% reduction in antipsychotic usage, having deployed pain check as part of other activities as well that have contributed to this, but pain check has contributed significantly to that. And in the same study cohort, we actually saw um, a 92% reduction in safeguarding incidents relating to behavioural symptoms where residents are striking other residents or unfortunately also caregivers at the same time. So um, some, some real staggering, um, you know, really eye-opening results there. It also gives a complete pain profile, which allows staff now to start predicting pain and improving outcomes, which can be used as evidence um, uh, to evidence care, I guess, to regulators as well. Um, from an admin point of view, pain check deliver training at the point of induction. So prior to using pain check as a tool, they receive formal training. Um, so that's not just how to use the tool, but also how to manage pain and how to recognize pain behaviors. So important that we do that, not just talk, you know, provide training on the app. It's, it's, it's about that, you know, bigger piece that we need to we need to support training on and that supports staff and potentially could lead to improved outcomes for residents. Pain check solves problems on documentation completely because all data is documented electronically. There's no paper handling. There's no duplication of efforts, no duplication of assessments, mitigating any risks. And it also saves a lot of time. Uh, another point to note, and this is in particular around technology um, and adoption of technology, is we want to strike the balance with the AI. This means pain check doesn't replace the human interaction with the resident. This is very important as the AI should be part of the team. It helps the care and also other healthcare professionals use their skills and knowledge that cannot be replaced by the technology, such as creativity, communication, critical thinking. Um, staff are empowered to complete assessments, whereas previously it may have been left to nursing clinical staff to complete assessments. Um, so um, that, that's been a really, really um, important um, finding. And also we've, we've seen that if you get an increase in distress and behaviours associated um, with, um, with pain, it can lead to uh, more time being spent potentially with that resident. Um, so our customers have told us that when they've got better control, um, they've seen a, a reduction in, uh, in uh, well, an increase in time saving essentially. Um, so they're just the sort of that they're, they're the sort of um, benefits. This, this be these benefits are getting deeper and deeper. This this um, you know as we learn more um, through our implementation. But I just thought I'd share some of the um, key learnings there. So conscious of time, there's so much more I can tell you about pain check, but hopefully this will give you a good overview. But if you'd like some further information, please do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, we're we're looking to expand wider across Wales. So it'd be good to speak to some of you uh, about how we can do that. Um, so that's pretty much it uh, from me. Amy, Thank back you. to you. Thank you, Tandy. And apologies, we are running over a little bit on time. We will try and Aaron, there's pressure on you next, but thank you, Tandy. Uh, and we are keen from the hub to, to collaborate with, with Tandy and with Paincheck to look at how we can roll this out across Wales. So please, if you've got any questions or you want to know more about it, please ask us, ask Tandy, and we will Try and respond in the chat or we'll get back to you in emails. But next up, we've got Aaron Edwards, Senior Project Manager from Tech Cymru. So Aaron, the pressure's on you now. Are we going to finish on time? And you, you can uh, have a go at Tandeep later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Aaron, over Just to you. Team. 
Sorry, Amy, I, I gave you a funny comeback then, but I was on mute. Right, so <laughs> I'll try my best to keep it as quick as possible. Uh, most of us know um, about about telecare anyway, so I won't, I won't gloss over, I won't sort of speak too much in, in depth about, about what telecare is. Um, so I'll just give you a brief overview of how it can help individuals with dementia in terms of the, um, the more sophisticated bits of kit. Um, so I'm Aaron Edward, as Amy said, I'm leading the telecare programme uh, as part of Tech Cymru. Uh, so we're the National Technology Enabled Care Programme um for uh, technology, technology enabled care activity uh, across wales so telecare firmly within the sort of social care area but we do have two complementary programs as part of the wider portfolio uh, which was video consulting so as rebecca was mentioning earlier we did a lot on the attend anywhere side of things um, and also telehealth so um telecare for anyone who doesn't know although i'm sure most of you do know um, is the remote exchange of data between sensors that are situated in a citizen's home um, and an alarm receiving center uh, typical packages consist of a base alarm and a pendant device, which is manual activation. So that's kind of entry level telecare, very bog standard and not for individuals or they shouldn't be for individuals with some form of cognitive impairment, such as dementia. Um, you know, more sort of automatic activation sensors um, should be prescribed for individuals um, who are suffering from uh, cognitive impairment, such as fall detectors, which automatically kind of send, um, you know, an alarm call uh, as opposed to having the red button being manually pressed. Uh, and then you've got bed chair and door for example but i'll go into a little bit more detail of those in a minute um so the numbers in wales we recently surveyed um the entire pop well, what's the, the entire population um we recently surveyed all 22 local authorities that offer telecare um to to its citizens in wales we arrived at an estimated figure of roughly 77,000. Um, so that equates um, to around about 34% of the entire over 85 population. Telecare is very reactive by nature. So typically the users that have it are kind of 80 plus in terms of the um, when we look at the bandings. But you do have a lot of people kind of over 65 that have telecare, um, but it, it's mainly centered within that kind of 80 plus. So we know dementia, um, NHS states that dementia affects every one person in 20, uh, over 65 in Wales. So doing a little bit of modern yesterday evening, putting these together, we arrived at a figure um, of est there's an estimated 3,850 uh, telecare users who have dementia. Um, and 60% of people with dementia will live in their own home. Um, and this is an example, just sort of visualising it, bringing it to life a little bit of what types of sensors go into the home um, and these are all automatic they won't require any kind of like manual um, kickoff so a door sensor is typically for people who would uh, walk at night for example um, so a, an alert would be sent over to the alarm receiving center to send out uh, you know some help um, or at least get some family on the way um, a high temperature sensor doubles up as a low temperature sensor so someone with dementia for example might forget to put the heating on um, or might keep the heating on uh, both are going to lead to things like dehydration etc um, so a high temperature sensor slash low temperature sensor and the low temperature is roughly two, uh, roughly two degrees high temperature is it could be anywhere but it's usually sort of stated around about the 26 27 degree mark um, you've then got carbon monoxide detectors um, bed sensors fall detectors and smoke detectors the bed sensor is the only one on there other than the door sensor that is timed so you'd usually put it on say 11 o'clock in night when the care is uh, you know the last care call um leaves uh, through to sort of seven in the morning so it's active during those during those nighttime hours and if someone doesn't return to bed within a predetermined time usually sort of 15 to 20 minutes then an alert is signaled and and, and help is sent on the way um, this is just a core monitoring diagram. So there's a typical base alarm in the bottom left hand corner there. Um, any of those peripheral sensors we just mentioned will send a radio signal through to that alarm. That alarm then dials out either over the standard telephone network um, or the GSM network, which is your, your mo mobile. So it basically would be a SIM based alarm. Um, they hit the alarm receiving centre at the bottom there. Then an operator will access uh, via a secure database the, inf the information and it will come through and say smoke alarm. So the operator will, will kind of know how to triage that call or it'll say fall detector. Obviously, both would require a different um, ongoing call there to one of the stakeholders involved. But typically it could be a fall detector and you would send out either a response uh, member of the response team um, or it would be a call to emergency services. And there's seven council delivered alarm receiving centres in Wales that cover all 22 uh, councils. 
So some of the benefits of telecare to the user is that it provides peace of mind, keeps them safe in their own home, it connects them to loved ones quickly. There's remote access and support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there is limited evidence, but there is evidence out there that it reduces early onset into care homes and hospitals, um, and it promotes independence and autonomy. For carers, there's greater peace of mind, more downtime to rest and resume hobbies and interests, and the potential to reduce some caring tasks, for example, falls if you've got an unpaid carer or a loved one that goes to mum or dad to pick them up, can put a big toll on them as well. Um, so sending out some dedicated help and support um, obviously alleviates some of that pressure. Um, and it also may allow them to feel better supported um, in their caring role, knowing that, that someone is at the end of that alarm box. So our role specifically, so what are tech companies going to do and, and, and why have they employed me to lead the charge? So my background is coming from Cardiff Council and working in their telecare service for roughly 10 or so years. Um, and there was definitely a need for a national steer and some alignment because the discovery report that we that we uh, undertook, uh, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, um, did highlight the, the general sort of lack of consistency and coordination of telecare services. There's some really good pockets of innovation going on across Wales, um, but there needs to be a consistent steer, I think. Um, so we've, we've, we've sort of arrived at three sort of headlines or pillar statements, which is to champion telecare in Wales by becoming a centre of excellence. Um, oh, effectively taking an overview in terms of what's going on at the minute and how are we going to drive um, and, and help drive so, some more innovation within the sector as well. And that again is, is, is a driver there, the support and the shift of digital telecare that will open up Pandora's box, I would say, and, and lead to greater innovation within the sector in terms of devices using um, IoT as opposed to radio signaling. So you're, you're likely to see the digital migration, which is going to kick in um, sort of by the end of 2025, a lot more innovation within this specific sector and a lot more sort of closer alignment with, with telehealth and, and, and mass consumables and wearables and things. Um, and we're also going to promote telecare and more broadly tech development. So collecting and publishing research based evidence, uh, promoting tech projects on our project register. So anyone that's got a project um, at the moment on the go in Wales, uh, please let me know um, and we'll add it to our project register. Um, and we're, we're at, the, at the minute we're producing a telecare strategy for the next couple of years. Lastly, for me, the sort of the short term aims and aspirations for our telecare programme for this year. The vision ultimately is to be the centre of excellence for all telecare related activity. The first big project we're looking at at the moment is the citizen journey. So just trying to understand and establish more of a consistent understanding of the uh, telecare landscape in Wales from a data perspective, um, supplemented by three major projects there, which would be minimum telecare data sets. So that's consistency and assessment. So asking the same questions across Wales to onboard citizens to be in a, to, to be a telecare user um, during their lifespan as a telecare user, looking at business intelligence as well. So that provides benefits both the citizen, but also the local authority in terms of just how much money telecare is saving to the wider sort of allied sectors involved, such as health, social care and also the local authority. Um, and also establishing a common telecare record. So this is akin to the Finnish model where th there would be um, a certain amount of information would be expunged off into a third party health and social care platform. Um, so that would be very handy for a social worker going to do a reassessment of someone and having real time information about how many times Mrs Jones has fallen, for example, um, and whether there's more increased sort of wandering activity and things along those lines to, to obviously give her more of a, an understanding on how to reassess for telecare. So if we achieve that, telecare services are transformed and there's an increased efficiency across the board and the long term outcomes are achieved. The long term outcomes will be in the strategy that I'll share with Amy um, and it should be up for release very, very shortly. So, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Amy, I hope I've saved some time for you. If you want to stay in touch, there's our various social media handles. Thanks very much. Thank you very much and a round of applause to you for keeping that on time. <laughs> so, some nice ambitious plans and thank you Aaron for showing us you know what what the current kind of landscape is and where it's going to head now in the future um, and you have brought us in time to finish the event today on time perfect but thank you all for all the presenters that have been today and spoken and thank you all for attending I hope that you've all had the time and the space to learn something new share ideas and hopefully moving forward these are events that we can can have to have that bit of protective time and protective space to share what what good pieces of work are going on around Wales and across the UK. So if you do have any further comments or questions, please put them in the chat and we will get back to you via email. We will be putting these um, 
presentations online so that you will have videos that you can share and, and go back through. And if there's anything else, please get in touch. And thank you all for your time today and thank you for attending. And have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye. <laughs>